Good afternoon. Welcome to an online discussion on building a movement to stop long prison terms and address violence. My name is Tyrone Walker and I'm associate at the Justice Policy Institute. That is my obvious affiliation. But my affiliation with this project started while I was serving in long-term prison centers where they was doing interviews to build the momentum for such a powerful discussion. Then my second time, I called in the day after I was released to a small convenience that was happening in New York City. And it was talking about this, this problem with long-term prison centers and addressing violence. And the momentum was still building to stop this, to bring these discussions to the forefront. As I stated earlier, my obvious affiliation is my employment now at the Justice Policy Institute. We will be showing the world premiere of a short film, The Trouble with Long Prison Terms, and we will have two great panels. One we will discuss the current state level of efforts to roll back long prison terms, and the other is the forward looking discussion about how we can join together to build a powerful and vibrant movement for the safe communities without long prison terms. And without further ado, thank you all for being here and joining with us. And I'll now like to pass it over to Lenny of the Open Society Foundation. Uh, good afternoon, can folks hear me? Good, good, good. So good afternoon, thanks Tyrone. Um, I'm really, really pleased to be able to take part in this conversation. Um, first, I wanna thank uh, our colleagues at the Justice, our partners really at the Justice Policy Institute and at Brave New Films and many of you who helped get us to this point. I'm really excited about the conversation. I certainly wanted to thank my colleague, William Johnston, uh, program, senior program officer here at Open Society Foundations for helping to pull this together. I mean, as Tyrone said a few minutes ago, this is um, part of a series of conversations we at Open Society Foundations have been trying to help us have with our partners around tackling this problem of uh, long prison terms of excessive punishment. And something that's been on our mind for a number of years, I think I, I don't have to say, uh, I, I'm not saying anything to those of you on the call who don't already know that if we're really serious about tackling this problem of mass incarceration, we have got to have a conversation about long prison terms, excessive sentences, and um, how we might approach responses to um, violence and an attempt to uh, keep communities safe in a different way than we have uh, done over the last several decades. And we're really excited. I mean, Tyrone talked about these series of conversations and I think um, we were building momentum, but we're really excited to be having this conversation at this point in time in our nation's history. Um, I think it's a real opportunity. We have the country's attention in ways that we may not have had for many, many years about the failings of our criminal justice system across the board. And while that conversation has been instigated primarily by concerns about law enforcement and excessive force and, and policing, I think it has revealed sort of the, the problems in our criminal justice system, the structural racism, the anti-blackness that exists um, throughout our society is pronounced within our criminal justice system. And I think it provides us with an opportunity to use this opening to really instigate a more more thoughtful and a more impactful conversation about how we respond to violence. I think we all know that um, the way that we're currently responding with excessive prison terms is costly. It, um, and I think that the, the conversation about costs ought resonate. I think that uh, we can have a conversation with policymakers and our fellow citizens about the racial disparities that we find in the exacting of long prison terms uh, on our fellow citizens. I think we all know that these sentences do not keep us safe, right? Statistics show us that um, over incarceration does really nothing to promote public safety. Um, I think we know that it does not address uh, the harm that's caused by violence. I think that um, the work that many of you have done, the Alliance of Safety of Justice has done, um, shows that uh, crime victims need something different from, um, from our system in order to really be safe, in order to really be made 
whole, in order to address the harms caused by, um, uh, caused by whatever harm has been caused to them. Uh, and ultimately, we know it is inhumane in so many different ways. And I think that the uh, current pandemic has just underscored that um, in, in ways that allow us to tell the story that maybe people were able to avoid up until now. And so I'm really excited about the, the conversation. I'm really excited about the opportunity. Um, I'm so appreciative of the work that so many of you have done on this issue for so many, many years. And um, I think we've seen some successes already from, from your contributions, from your efforts. And I think that collectively, I think we can build on those. So I'm hoping this conversation will result in some good thinking, some good strategizing that will inform us, you individually, us as a foundation, as we think about our future investments. Um, so I'm really just excited about the conversation. I'm excited about the premiere of the film. Again, I wanna thank you for taking the time to spend a couple of hours with us. And I'm, I'm really um, confident that we will um, pass, we will plot a way forward um, that will help us begin to really undo what has been harmed that we've been doing to fellow citizens, to communities for far too long. So I just wanna thank you, thank our partners. And again, I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Tyrone, for kicking us off. And thank you, Lenny, for your words, um, but also for your guidance, encouragement, and trust over the years. I mean, none of this would be possible without your leadership, uh, both in the foundation and outside. Uh, and I'm, I'm privileged to work with you and to call you both boss and friend, um, which doesn't get to happen for many people. So thank you, Lenny. Uh, and greetings and thanks to all of you for joining us for today's important conversation. Um, as Lenny said, I'm William Johnson. I'm Senior Program Officer with the Open Society Foundations. And my work has focused on advancing decarceration strategies across the United States with an emphasis on challenging uh, life and other lengthy prison terms um, that regrettably are a feature of our retributive criminal legal system, uh, a primary driver of incarceration in the United States and our focus today. So today's event is part of an effort, as Lenny suggested, to encourage the decarceration movement's continued and expanded focus on ending uh, the costly and counterproductive reliance on long prison terms and harsh sentencing. Uh, it features two great panels, including leaders from across the country whose work represents the cutting edge from our perspective. Uh, and in addition, and what I've been asked to do is, I'm, I'm pleased to announce uh, the release today of two documents that uh, we hope uh, you will find useful to your work. The first is a paper prepared by the Justice Policy Institute entitled Real Steps Toward Ending Mass Incarceration, which collects observations and notes from uh, the December 2018 um, convening that Tyrone mentioned, uh, and also interviews uh, from folks across the movement. Um, the, the, the paper uh, took kind of this, this information in these interviews and, and uh, JPI's observations and kind of attempts to put together kind of the fields, um, uh, the fields kind of sense of what it will take to effectively challenge um, uh, long prison terms and violence. Um, the second uh, document uh, is the animated film that both Tyrone and Lenny mentioned uh, that we'll uh, view together shortly, entitled The Trouble with Long Prison Terms, uh, which outlines the importance of challenging long prison terms uh, to the goal of ending mass incarceration. So Justice Policy Institute's Ryan King and I conceived of the film back in 2017, when we were thinking through and kind of debating and discussing ways to describe kind of more simply the complicated relationship between long prison terms and prison populations while at the same time underscoring um, the, the, the point that levels of incarceration in the United States are not the result of levels of violence per se, but instead the nation's response to violence and its knee-jerk response to turning to excessive punishment uh, as a response. 
So in back in, I think it was June of 2019, uh, Ryan and I spoke with Jim Miller of Brave New Films and Jim got excited by the idea of taking on the challenge. And really from July of last year through April of this year, uh, the three of us and Jim's team spent a lot of time together um, making the film a reality. It's, it's been, to say it's been a labor of love is probably selling it short. Um, and we're, we're really thrilled to present it to you today. Um, both the paper and the film are available on Justice Policy Institute's website, and that's justicepolicy.org slash long dash prison dash terms um, with additional information on uh, the topic. And you can also find the film uh, on Brave New Films website and YouTube channel. Uh, we hope you find them useful to your work, and we encourage you to download, review, and share them with your networks. So with that, um, I want to turn it over to Jim Miller, the executive director of Brave New Films, uh, who will talk a little bit about Brave New Films' work uh, and then uh, set us up with the film. Thank you all. Thank you so much, William. And thank you, Lenny and Tyrone and Ryan. Uh, it has been an honor to work with you all on this. For those of you who aren't familiar with Brave New Films, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that creates content around social justice issues. We focus mainly on criminal justice, racial equity, immigration reform, gun safety, and throughout this last year on voter suppression. Uh, we use this platform, social media, to get our content out to the public. But primarily, we use schools and faith communities. So we provide, there's about 1,500 faith communities and over 3,000 schools that we work with providing free content and discussion guides on these very important issues so that there's a deeper understanding and people are better educated around these important issues. When William and Ryan came to me about this, I was, as William said, very excited because this is an issue that we've been working on for a while. We've been working with Open Society Foundations for the past six or seven years, I believe. I first met Lenny uh, those many years ago and he introduced me to William and we've done uh, many different projects uh, on restorative justice and other important issues. And, and now this, and I'm so happy that we are able to share it with you all. And without any further ado, now the trouble with long prison terms. Thank you. The US now realizes it faces an incarceration crisis. Once seen as a marginal issue, Americans of all stripes are now raising concerns about our country's inclination toward punishment that drives overcriminalization and mass incarceration. Pressure by impacted communities and advocates has emboldened elected officials and candidates to question public policies that lead to excessive incarceration. Since the early 2000s, states and more recently the federal government have made policy choices that have safely reduced their prison populations. Reformers have set a goal to cut incarceration in half, and calls for prison abolition coming from directly impacted communities are gaining acceptance. However, most reforms have been limited to nonviolent offenses. But we will lose the modest progress made and fail to end mass incarceration if we cling to long prison terms and the outmoded approach to serious and violent crime they represent. To understand why, let's look at what makes the US prison population so large the size of any population is a function of how many people enter and leave it in a given year. This is true of a planet, a hospital, and even the number of people in prison. Each year, some number of people enter our nation's prison system. Experts refer to this number as admissions. Policy decisions such as laws that criminalize drugs or lock someone up for stealing a cell phone result in increased admissions and grow the prison population. Policies that reduce or eliminate the reliance on incarceration, like laws that legalize drugs or that prohibit sending a person to prison for failing to pay fines and court fees, reduce admissions and lead to a reduction of the prison population. Each year, at the same time as some number of people enter the prison system, some number of people exit. 
Every person who enters prison remains there for a period of time required by their sentence and other considerations. Experts refer to this as length of stay. Policy decisions that require people to spend more time in prison, mandatory minimum, three strikes, and life without parole sentences reduce the number of exits and increase the prison population. At any given time, the prison population includes a mix of individuals admitted for a range of offenses and with various associated lengths of stay. Although it is easy to grasp how the number of admissions might impact the prison population, the significant impact length of stay has is less apparent. To simplify, let's imagine length of stay in terms of its impact on the speed at which three different groups exit prison. Under current trends and policies, each year roughly 55% of prison admissions are for low-level offenses, 39% are for more serious crimes, and only 6% are for very serious and violent crimes. People from these three groups exit prison at different speeds because of the lengths of stay associated with them by sentencing and release policies. Our first group includes people in prison for terms of fewer than three years, generally for drug and property offenses. It also typically includes people entering for technical violations of community supervision. Our second group includes people serving prison terms of three to 10 years, generally for more serious crimes, like assault and robbery. And our third group includes people who serve 10 or more years in prison, mostly for repeat offenses or for very serious crimes involving violence. Although every year a smaller number of people enter for serious and violent crime, over time their numbers stack up because they move out of the population more slowly. This stacking effect explains how it can be simultaneously true that while fewer people enter prison each year for serious and violent crime, the majority of people in prison are there for such crimes. Although every year the majority of people who enter prison do so for nonviolent offenses, more than half of the prison population is composed of people convicted of a violent offense. This is a result of harsh sentencing policies and extremely restrictive release policies that lead to a longer length of stay. This explains why we will fail to end mass incarceration without confronting our reliance on long prison terms that gained favor in the get tough 1980s and 90s and have since gotten longer and harsher driving America's prison population to its peak in 2009 and keeping it large today. In addition to swelling the prison population, long prison terms are disproportionately imposed on people of color and have resulted in a rapidly growing number of elderly people in prison. The experience of the state of Alabama illustrates how focusing solely on sending fewer people to prison and reducing the amount of time they must remain there for less serious offenses is not enough to reduce mass incarceration. In recent years, the state has reduced the number of people serving shorter prison terms. But while the share of its prison population serving shorter terms has dropped, the share serving long terms has steadily climbed. Those serving long prison terms in Alabama have canceled out the benefits of reforms that have reduced admissions. Yes, policymakers from both sides of the aisle have begun to acknowledge that the nation's over-reliance on incarceration is a costly and critical issue. Reducing incarceration should not stop at reforms related to less serious offenses. Ignoring long prison terms threatens to undermine the criminal justice reform successes of the last decade. Ending mass incarceration will require addressing the stacking effect of long prison terms, which calls for an ambitious effort to change how our country responds to violence and how we treat people who commit serious crime.
Hi, everybody. It's Mark Schindler from the Justice Policy Institute, and uh, thank you for all, uh, all of you joining us today. Um, we've got quite a good uh, number of folks uh, uh, participating. I think we had about 500 people register, and I'm really uh, pleased and honored to participate today. Uh, thankful to our colleagues at Open Society Foundations, Brave New Films, uh, for helping and to produce that, that really powerful um, uh, short film that you just saw. Our, our hope is that uh, this will be a tool uh, for those working uh, on these issues in the field, uh, as well as the white paper that's been produced um, and so that all of us can start to come together uh, around these very challenging issues. Um, as, the, as the film uh, explained and as, as the earlier speakers have spoken to, uh, we've, we've made progress on criminal justice reform uh, in the last decade or so. We still have a long ways to go, um, but we have made progress. Most of that progress has been on uh, nonviolent uh, uh, offenses, people uh, going to jail and prison and in the system for property and drug crimes, and much less so. Uh, for people involved in violent crime, although there has been some, uh, some progress. Uh, we, we wanted to share with you today uh, thoughts from, from leaders in the field. And our first panel are uh, three amazing leaders who are doing incredible work. I think to, our goal is to show what's possible, uh, that we can take on these issues involving uh, serious crime and violence and how that connects to producing safer communities, which is all of our goal. Um, and, and really to share lessons learned and think together about how we can all uh, push this issue forward more effectively in the future. So thanks again for joining us. And uh, I'm thrilled to be able to moderate this uh, powerhouse panel, uh, the, the first group of speakers. So joining us today is Jose Saldana, who's the director of RAP, uh, Releasing Aging People in Prison. Um, also, Ramarilyn Ralston, who's the executive director of Project Rebound, um, as well as uh, a, a leader and a policy advisor for the California uh, Coalition for Women uh, Prisoners, which I think Marilyn will, will share more about that. And finally, not last but not least, uh, Salim Holbrook, who's the executive director of the Abolitionist Law Center in Pennsylvania. Um, I should have mentioned Jose is, is focused mostly in his work in, in New York. So we have three people uh, on the front lines, doing the hard work, uh, trying to change policy and practice uh, to reduce the amount of time that people are serving in prison um, and, and really think about how we can use our resources uh, more effectively. Um, coincidentally, they all happen to have uh, experience with the system as well. Uh, so they bring that perspective between the three of them, uh, they have served approximately 80 years uh, in prisons in, in New York, Pennsylvania, and, and California. So they do have that perspective, but first and foremost, they are uh, leaders and policy advocates and incredible voices for reform in their state. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, I wanna start off uh, first by going to you, Jose, um, and ask you, ask you if you can just frame this issue a bit from, from your perspective and share a little bit about the work that, that RAP is doing in New York State um, and how you all have been, have been taking on these issues, if you will get us kicked off. Yes, thank you. Uh, and I wanna thank Jim and his crew for the brilliantly uh, produced film that uh, clearly illustrates the problems that we're talking about in such simple, clear terms. Um, During my third year, uh, my third decade uh, of incarceration, I actually thought that more people were dying, more elder people were dying in the New York State prison system than were being released. And, and I had to start thinking in terms that I may well be next. Uh, so that, that there to me was the problem. And the problem we call it death by incarceration. And it is this crisis of death by incarceration that was created by mass incarceration. And this is the crisis that RAP evolved from. And RAP sought to correct this problem because harsher sentences with little opportunities for release at the back end uh, 
And men and women in New York State prisons were getting older, sick, and dying. So this is the crisis that, that we all face, and not only in New York, but across the country. And, and, and it is a crisis that was created by the, the racist policies that targeted our community, the Black and Latinx communities. So we sought to address this through, through legislative action. And, and, and these two legislative actions were actually a moderate approach to the, to the problem that devastated our communities for generations. And this is simply that to decarcerate, you know, start the process of decarcerating without any uh, exclusions. Just start decarcerating. And our elder parole bill does just that. And it, and it, and it focuses on the men and women who have already languished in prison for three to four decades. Start the decarceration for these people who will, in all likelihood, die in prison unless we start decarcerating because we know that life sentences, especially in New York, New York State, means for most people the death penalty because the New York State Parole Board has been complicit in implementing the racist policies of mass incarceration, perpetually denying parole release to eligible men and women who have been an asset to every prison they have been in and will be an asset to their home communities. So not only does it devastate the individual that's incarcerated, it devastates his or her families and the entire community is impacted by this. This is why it's so critical that we come to some type of viable solutions to stop this mass incarceration for decades. Great. Th thank you so much, Jose. Um, and we'll come back to you uh, to talk a little bit about uh, what, what you're seeing and how the, how the uh, efforts in New York are, are playing out. Um, I want to shift maybe over to the, to the West Coast. So we just heard from, from New York and uh, Romarilyn sw switch to you and ask if, if you can uh, give your perspective on this. Uh, on this issue of people who have uh, gone to prison for long sentences. I know you're doing a lot of work, uh, particularly with, with women in California who have served long sentences like yourself. And just share a little bit with us sort of how you think about these issues and, and how your work is playing out. First of all, thank you, Mark and Jim, for, for having me uh, on this panel this morning. Uh, the work of the California Coalition for Women Prisoners, CCWP, has uh, made remarkable strides in decarcerating uh, California prisons. Um, as you know, California has some of the largest prisons in the nation. And we currently have a, a little over 40,000, I believe, incarcerated folks serving life, life without the possibility of parole or virtual life sentences. Uh, there's approximately uh, 4,000 women uh, incarcerated here in California, uh, many of them uh, serving long-term sentences over 10 years. California Coalition for Women Prisoners works specifically um, with members inside those prisons. A lot of our members are serving life without the possibility of parole. Uh, since the inception and beginning of CCWP, we've worked tirelessly uh, to get women free from those cages um, through medical advocacy, legal advocacy, and just overall support. Most women who are incarcerated are incarcerated for sexual violence and trauma. Uh, it's relational when women enter the prison system. Uh, many of the women who are members of the California Coalition for Women Prisoners have been incarcerated for decades. Um, I'll say this about CTWP's work uh, for the last five years, we've been really focused on our Drop LWAP campaign. Uh, we've been calling for the, the past governors to commute all 5,000 sentences um, to be commuted. Uh, we've had, I think, some progress uh, with 
uh, Gavin Newsom, our current governor, our former Ga uh, governor, Jerry Brown, was, uh, I, I think, pretty good with uh, commuting some of the sentences, but could have done uh, a lot more. Uh, he did release 147 uh, LWAPs and commuted their, I'm sorry, he commuted 147 LWAPs. They weren't all released, but their sentences were commuted and now they have the possibility of parole. Uh, we've been working with, in coalition with a lot of really amazing California organizations here, uh, Ella Baker Center, uh, Californians for Safety and Justice, Initiate Justice, Smart Justice California, uh, working with legislators to pass um, an elder parole bill, uh, which is now sit sitting on the governor's desk. Uh, we urge him to sign anyone who's listening to this conversation today. Uh, please urge Governor Gavin Newsom to sign and pass um, AB uh, 3432, uh, the elder parole bill. Uh, please support with that. And, you know, we just keep pushing uh, to inform the public about, you know, the, the travesty of keeping women incarcerated uh, and any person incarcerated for, for life. Uh, most women who are incarcerated with life and life without the possibility of parole have been uh, charged with really aiding and abetting. Uh, they're not the primary perpetrators of the crime. And again, you know, the, the point of contact that women have in the commission of crimes is usually after the fact, but yet they are saddled with, you know, really long prison terms. And so the work of CCWP is really amazing. We've, we've started to develop a nationwide coalition of organizations working with RAP. Thank you, Jose, for all of the work. We're, we're really, um, you've modeled the way for us here in California working on Elder Perot. And so um, we're, we're just really grateful to have partners and colleagues and comrades across the country working in concert to decarcerate and end life and life without the possibility of parole uh, in our country, because it is costly. Uh, it destroys communities. Um, it impacts women in, in ways uh, that it doesn't impact men. Uh, many women are sentenced to life and life without the possibility of parole early on um, in their lifespan. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, it's just really devastating for women to be inside and, and it's devastating for their children and communities. And if they don't have children, you know, these types of long sentences uh, and disrupt uh, their opportunities to have families uh, on the outside. And so it's, yeah. it's really costly for states and it's costly for people. Well, well thanks for that, Marilyn, and, and particularly thank you for your, your work. I mean, you talk about pushing, uh, and I know that's sort of in some ways a nice way for saying what the amazing work that you're doing and it's inspirational. Um, we'll, we'll come back to you because I also know that you wear multiple hats, uh, including your work with uh, Project Rebound and, and Cal State uh, Fullerton. So we'll ask to talk a little bit about that. But um, before we do that, let me, let me go to uh, Celine uh, Holbrook uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, in Philadelphia right now. Um, uh, and, and Celine, you heard you know, Jose and Romarilyn and sort of their perspective, including Romarilyn talking about people you know, going away when they're very young. Of course, you have, you know, insights into that. Um, but I wonder if you could just talk generally also about how you see these issues, um, your work in Pennsylvania, and are, are you hopeful, you know, what challenges you might see um, as, as we take on these, these issues, if you can share with us. And, and again, thank you to you and, and all of our panelists for being here with us this, today. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, Pennsylvania is ground zero when it comes to harsh and long-term prison sentences. And I speak to that as someone who was impacted by those sentences and come from communities that are predominantly impacted by these harsh long-term sentences. 
I go back to being involved in prison activism, whether it was inside or outside to the early 90s. And I could tell you that there's been four areas or four lanes that abolitionists, decarcerate, de people advocating for decarceration and people advocating for substantive prison reform have been advocating for in Pennsylvania. And that is parole eligibility for lifers, comprehensive sentencing reform around parole, ending long-term solitary confinement and amending the Post-Conviction Relief Act in Pennsylvania that severely impedes people's ability to have their cases overturned or even heard by courts. Pennsylvania had more children sentenced to life without parole than any other state in the country. At the same time, Philadelphia, the county that I'm from, had the most children sentenced to life without parole than any um, city in the country. But also this is something that Philadelphia has sentenced more people to life without parole than any jurisdiction in the country. Even Harris County, Texas. You know, We hear a lot about Harris County, Texas and a lot of other locales, even in Florida. So in Pennsylvania, there was an urgency and necessity to address these sentences. And one of the things that came about that was a narrative change when it comes to language. For example, we felt as though life without parole was sanitizing what a life without parole sentence is for not just children, but also for people over the age of 18. And it is an, a death sentence. It's a terminal sentence. You are sentencing someone to die in prison. So that's where the term death by incarceration emerged from. And it's not surprising that it emerged from Pennsylvania, which was ground zero for these type of sentences. Some of the main challenges that we find in Pennsylvania, and this is, I think, something that we see all across the state. And I don't want to put groups out there, but it's kind of like that saying, the road to hell, hell is paved by good intentions. Mm -hmm. People are so quick to look for that low hanging fruit to address mass incarceration that they don't see how ultimately that impedes or harms movements and people who have been impacted on the ground in these states who have been fighting for decades for substantive change to long-term prison sentences. And I'll give you an example. I explained to you what those four lanes were that people were fighting with in Pennsylvania since the early 90s. And there were strides being made in some of those lanes, but about two years ago, a national organization came in Pennsylvania and dumped millions of dollars into the state to address probation reform in the state legislature. And essentially what this did was all of the work that activists have been putting on the ground across the state of Pennsylvania, hard work, mind you work that was not funded work that was led by family members, mothers, grandmothers, sisters, friends, communities, all of the hard work that they put into the advances that we made and getting a, a bill submitted in the house to, to end death by incarceration, life without parole, to getting legislation introduced that would end long-term prison sentencing, to getting even the thought of presumptive parole considered. All of this was pushed to the side by this maniacal push to get a victory for probation in Pennsylvania, Yeah. right? And so it set us back probably 10 years in Pennsylvania because one thing that people don't understand about coming into Pennsylvania is Pennsylvania is a village state. It has a village mentality. Um, the city I'm from Philadelphia, we're the same way. It doesn't take the outsiders coming into the state dictating or even rationalizing change. That change has to come from the grassroots. Um, and even the probation bill that was pushed wind up to be one of the most terrible pieces of legislation in the past 10 years in Pennsylvania when it comes to criminal justice reform because it actually increased state surveillance on people who are on probation. It did not end stacking probation sentences. It, and essentially it, it made probation worse. Um, so that's one of, that's one of the, difficult challenges that 
not on, that I face, not just as an executive director, but also as someone who is part of the Coalition to Abolish Death by Incarceration, which is a statewide movement um, right. of activists and family members seeking to end long-term sentences. Um, running into that type of, good, those type of good intentions that sideline the hard work that we're doing, because listen, and, and I don't wanna take up too much space here, Pennsylvania, the majority of people in prison in Pennsylvania are in prison for violent offenses. The majority of people who are black and brown in Pennsylvania's state prisons are in prison for violent offenses. Across the country, 17% of the people who are incarcerated are incarcerated for nonviolent offenses. So that shows you that there's a lot more people in prison that we have to address. And yep. even if we were to address that 17%, it, is, it only amounts to two, close to 200,000 people. That is the prison population in the early 70s when the rise of mass incarceration started. And it's not a coincidence that mass incarceration started in the early 70s when political power for black communities was increasing. When the political system was opening up for black communities, more mayors were being elected, more state representative, more United States congressmen. So you could see the rise of mass incarceration tied with the empowerment of black um, political power. So I do want to drop that in there because I think it's very important that we see these connections um, between mass incarceration and the historical oppression of black and brown communities in this country. I, I really appreciate you saying that, Salim. So much of, you know, what there's so much what you just, just said as well as Jose and from Maryland. Um, including, you know, that piece about what, you know, what you talk about, the, the, the good intentions of reforms that sometimes make other reforms uh, more challenging, particularly this dynamic with uh, folks in, in the deeper end of the system. You also talked about narrative change and the importance of that. And that's come up a lot. Folks will see that in the, in the white paper that's being issued today. And I, I wanna go back to you, Jose, um, and if you could talk a little bit, um, you also alluded, Jose, to the moment we're in, right, in terms of uh, both COVID and then, of course, as, as Salim was referencing, um, these issues that are coming up around uh, power or lack of power in the Black community and the communities of color. We're in a moment uh, where people at least are talking about Black Lives Matter and, and, and protesting. Um, really important conversations that are happening. Can, can you talk a little bit about how you guys at RAP think about the narrative and how has this current moment uh, that we're in, both within the pandemic and within the, the, the protests and what's going on uh, following George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others, how has that impacted your work and how do you guys think about these issues uh, today? Yes, yes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it, it appears that uh, this massive movement, which is a wonderful, uh, exceptional movement, has left us behind. Uh, incarcerated Black and Latinx lives matters also. And that's what we try to uplift. Because uh, while, you know, we, you know, we have to, we have to support any movement that exposes the racism, the brutality, uh, of this racist system, we, we have to join hands and forces with all those who are opposing such, such brutality on our communities. We must also recognize that the same type of brutality exists behind the walls. I know that for a fact. Uh, I've seen when men were brutally beaten to death, I mean, just kicked everywhere, everywhere you can possibly kick a man until they die right there and then drag them out. Uh, uh, and if they survive such brutality, you know, with eye sockets hanging out, wrists broken, jaws broken, then they'll be charged with, with assaulting eight to 10 correction officers mm -hmm. and, and will probably be convicted by a all right rural jury. So this is the system of brutality that we face just about every day of our lives. And, and, and this, and, and we also, I want to add that the substandard medical treatment that, that we face is, is a health crisis that we face and some of us for decades. With all this comes COVID-19. So, you know, so you can just imagine that, you know, we, I mean, we, ours were against us as it is now, now they're super against us. 
and what rap did, we had to focus uh, or actually shift our attention from legislative advocacy because that takes a lot of time and COVID-19 derailed our, our state legislators. You know, they took a break and shut down Albany. So that, that kind of put a halt on our advocacy work for these bills that would transform the, just the criminal legal system. So we focus on two things, uh, clemency, mass clemency for all the elderly people with underlying health conditions, no exclusions. The, the crime of conviction or the length of sentence should not even be in the equation. These men were not, and women were not sentenced to death. And this here is a death. If they get infected by this virus, in all likelihood, they will not survive. So we focus on granting clemency for, for all of them. And, and we didn't have too much success because our governor is, is still a prosecutor. He still thinks like a prosecutor that he is. And, and we also focus on the parole board. Elder people who have already been granted parole you know, we're not talking about no real radical changes here. They've already been granted parole that their, their release should be expedited because in the two months that they're waiting to be released, they could very well be infected by this virus and not survive it. And those who are to appear before the parole board within the next 18 months or so that they should expedite their parole hearing so that they could be granted parole and be released rather than risk them being infected by a virus that they may not survive. So these are the two things that we focus on and we have had some success with the parole board. In fact, the parole board release rate has climbed to the, to the early 50s, the highest it's been in decades. So yeah. um, we had some kind of success in that. So, yeah, so seeing some successes, which is really heartening in light of, though, as, as you're putting out there, so, you know, these challenges are real, but the, the organizing that you're doing on the ground and the, and the progress is starting to happen. I think, I think Salim was trying to get in. Uh, Salim, if you have a thought, and then uh, we want to make sure we have time for Romarilyn as well before we, before we close out. Sure, definitely. I just wanted to say that in Pennsylvania, I think because of the origins of our movements in Pennsylvania, we have been very successful in connecting with the current climate around um, police accountability, defunding the police. Um, we have been connecting the national uprising to, well, actually identifying for, for what it is, the national uprising against state violence, because that's what police violence is. We've been connecting this with prison violence in terms of people who are in solitary confinement for decades, prisoners who are killed in solitary confinement. Um, we're representing the family of a prisoner who was pepper sprayed to death, handcuffed. He was hit with multiple births of OC C spray by Department of Correctional Officers while he was handcuffed on the ground. And as he was being escorted to the restricted housing unit, he collapsed several times saying that he couldn't breathe, he couldn't breathe. Those were his last words. And he died in the holding cell of, of uh, cardiac um, arrest, I believe, as a result, he, he was suffered from asthma. And when people are talking to us about, you know, what are our positions on um, the police, uh, the uprising against police brutality, we are very quick to make that connection that the same way there is a absence of accountability for the harm that police officers do in our community, there is also an absence of accountability for a harm that the prison system imposes on people on the inside. The death of a person in state custody should have just as much attention as the death of someone on the outside who was gunned down by police officers. So in Pennsylvania, we've been very effective because we've partnered with Black Lives Matter Philly, um, Philly uh, Real, uh, uh, racial uh, Committee for uh, uh, Economic and Social Justice. So we've been very successful in connecting our movement against mass incarceration with the, the national movement against um, police violence. And that's a result of one thing, the movements in Philadelphia, the grassroots movements that I'm a part of, the Abolitionist Law Center, the Coalition to Abolish Death by Incarceration, Human Rights Coalition, they were all inspired or co-founded by political prisoners in Pennsylvania who are still alive, former members of the Black Panther Party and Black Liberation Army. So we've already had that orientation because 50 years ago, 
the political prisoners in prison now, Mumia Abu-Jamal, Russell Maroon Schultz, Fred Burton, were in the streets fighting against Frank Rizzo's racist police regime in Philadelphia. And we haven't forgotten that. And we're just as committed to getting them out today as people are committed to ending police violence. So I do wanna ground us in that moment right now because we do have political prisoners in Pennsylvania who responded to this moment 50 years ago and still in prison. And they're not being advocated for. There's not a lot of money. Actually, there's no funding going to that struggle. And that's something that a lot of us should really think about because we need to bring them people out. I, I really appreciate you connecting the dots there for us, that this is obviously not a new conversation. This work has been going on in the community for a long time. I also really appreciate you highlighting a couple of issues that, and, and Jose did as well, the brutality that we see uh, behind the walls, uh, including as you, as you said, Salim, on the, on the solitary uh, confinement issue. Um, you know, I, I give shout out to some of our, our colleagues and partners. The ACLU is leading the um, Unlock the Box campaign, right? And I think there's ways we can connect these issues. Uh, I think about what you pointed out um, in Pennsylvania, particularly. We know the uh, the numbers, as you as you said, of uh, people who went to prison for life sentences when they were children. Um, you being one of them, and I think about our our friends and colleagues at the Campaign for Fair Sentencing of Youth who have really led that effort to undo those laws. Uh, you and Tyrone, who kicked us off, uh, I think are, are with us today, partly because of that work uh, to change the laws, but we, we need to go further. Um, I'm, I'm gonna turn to you, Romarilyn. Uh, we This panel could go on, I know, for quite a long time. There's so much to, that you have to, to share with us. Uh, but we're going to transition in just a couple of minutes to our next panel, which is also going to build on this conversation, talking about building that movement uh, that, that Salim was just alluding to. Um, but I wonder, Romarilyn, if you could talk a little bit about, from your perspective in California, um, the work that you're doing, where you see opportunity, where you see challenge, how has COVID and uh, the, 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 the uprising you know, the, the call for racial justice in this country that is at a new level now, not where it needs to be, but, but uh, louder and stronger than maybe it's been in recent years. How has that played out? And are, are you hopeful? Do you see opportunity? Share some, you know, where would you, you encourage us to go moving forward, if you could? Well, I, I start with saying that, you know, COVID-19 has, really raised awareness uh, about incarcerated people. You know, COVID, the, the rate of infection uh, in our prisons has spread so rapidly that um, we, we can't even monitor it. Thousands uh, of folks have been infected by this virus and it has caught the attention of not just the, the folks inside these cages and our families, but also the general public and legislators and around the world. And I think that's one of the, the most promising things that we have with addressing mass incarceration. It's raising awareness around mass incarceration. You know, Ruthie Gilmore said, where life is precious, life is precious. All life is precious. And so connecting that with the Black Lives Matter movement and with incarceration and ending mass incarceration and decarceration abolitionist efforts, COVID-19 has helped to connect all of this together by humanizing us all. And we're all at risk. And I think that's why we're here today having panels like this and continuing to have conversations around these connections and bridges because folks who are incarcerated come from our communities and they come back to our communities. And so we wanna make sure that they come back healthy and strong. But I, I just wanna say that, you know, incarcerated women have, have suffered um, not just through COVID-19, but just the violence that women endure going into the system and while they're part of the system. 
And that's the work of CCWP. I think it's been really instrumental since the rise of incarcerated women in the 80s. You know, CCWP has been around 25 years and it's been advocating for the protections and the release of women. This is not new. I think bringing women into these conversations is new. And I appreciate having this space to talk about incarcerated women because oftentimes we're left out of these conversations. And there's a quarter of a million incarcerated women uh, in this country. And so we need to, when we talk about incarceration and mass incarceration, we have to include women in this conversation. And with COVID-19, we have women aging who are more susceptible to infection rates. Uh, they have autoimmune uh, challenges. And so the work of CCWP is to bring that attention, not just to legislators, but to the general public, you know, and let them know that incarcerated women are already inside these cages experiencing so many issues that we can't even begin to think about the violence that happens inside as Jose mentioned, the sexual violence, the verbal violence, the physical violence that women endure in prison is the same as men, if not worse, because there's this two tier vi violence, the, the prison regime violence that women are impacted by. And then there's, you know, the, the, the violence that we come from when we enter into these spaces. So it's, it's challenging all around, but I am, I am a little hopeful that these connections that we're making and humanizing all people, because we're all susceptible to COVID-19 and now we have a lot of state legislators and states looking at ways to get people free who are trapped inside of some of these prisons and institutions because they now are sentenced to death. That's right. And so Robert mentioned that. I, I think that's a, a perfect point. And so that's been a lot of the work that we've done here in California is letting our legislators know that not only is being sentenced to life and life without the possibility, death sentences, but also everyone who's incarcerated in these facilities where COVID-19 is spreading so rapidly are now facing death by incarceration. Yeah, well, well thank you so much, Romero, and, and, and to all the panelists, uh, Jose and, and Salim for sharing your time um, and, and, and most importantly for your leadership. You are driving change in, in your states and around the country uh, that is so important. Uh, like I said, we, I, I know we could go on for quite a while, but um, we're gonna uh, have to hand the baton over to our next group of amazing uh, panelists. As, as I do that, I wanna just sort of segue to, to my colleague, Ryan King, um, and, and some of the points you were making, both for Marilyn and, and uh, Jose, Jose talked about uh, the importance of, of realizing that uh, incarcerated black and brown lives matter, right? And the people who are behind the bars, we're, I think, really um, very fortunate today uh, to have such an amazing group of people, including someone who's currently incarcerated. Which, which doesn't often happen in these conversations. And so on the next panel, we have uh, Joel Castone joining us uh, from DC's uh, jail. And I wanna thank the DC Department of Corrections for, for helping to make that possible. Um, but I was thinking, Romarilyn, as you were talking, I, I was texting just a little while ago with Joel's mom, uh, Maddie Castone. Uh, and, and, you know, she was so excited to have Joelle as part of this conversation, but also uh, I can only just imagine as a parent uh, having a child within some place during this time of COVID. We're also worried about our, our children. Uh, and, and you know, she was thinking about, about Joelle and the conditions on the inside. So I really appreciate, Romarilyn, you sharing that perspective in this time that we're in. And also, I think we're just, we're blessed to be able to have someone as well 
who's currently incarcerated to talk about it from their perspective. So I just wanted to say that a shout out to Joelle's mom, who I know is watching uh, and seeing her son, I think for the first time uh, in many, in many, many months because of, of COVID. Um, and with that, thank you again. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Ryan King, uh, to introduce the next panel and uh, continue the conversation. Thanks everyone. And here you go, Ryan, it's yours. Thank you, Mark, and hello, everybody. As Mark mentioned, I'm Ryan King. I'm the Director of Urban Research and Policy with the Justice Policy Institute. Um, what an incredible conversation and a really inspiring example of the depth and breadth of work challenging long prison term that's already ongoing at the state level. Um, rolling back long prison terms, really, it's got to be centered in any decarceration campaign, and I think these three organizations are showing you how that looks in 2020. We're gonna shift the, the conversation a little bit and kick off a discussion that tries to link these, like, these decarceration efforts with other ongoing struggles uh, for racial justice and equity uh, during a global pandemic. Uh, the fight against mass incarceration exists in parallel and ideally in partnership with demands for safe and healthy communities, public health-based responses to the trauma of violence and nationwide calls for reform, defunding and outright abolition of law enforcement in the wake of a number of high profile police killings of black and brown Americans. These issues are front and center and are being debated in the streets, on social media and in the presidential debate. However, conversations about rolling back mass incarceration, violence prevention, and how to address the trauma caused by violence often exist in silos. But as Salim mentioned in the prior panel, there is a strong link between police violence and prison violence. They are all examples of state violence. A pathway forward demands a deeper exploration into these issues to find the common ground that's driven violence and identify solutions grounded in the communities that have suffered so deeply. We have a terrific panel assembled today to talk about how we knock down some of these artificial silos and build a strong movement for reform that goes beyond addressing the symptoms and attacks the systemic root causes of racism, police violence, community violence, and mass incarceration. No small task. We're joined today by Joelle Castone, the founding mentor of the Young Men Emerging Unit in Washington, DC. Fatima Lauren Dreyer, the Executive Director of the Health Alliance for Violence Intervention, and Danielle Sered, the Executive Director of Common Justice. Kumar Rao, the Director of Justice Transformation for the Center for Popular Democracy, he intended to join us today, but was called away, unfortunately, at the very last minute to deal with an emergency and sends along his apologies. We'll miss his contributions to the conversation, but look forward to a terrific conversation with our assembled panelists. And so I wanna kick off with uh, my friend and colleague, Joelle, um, to, uh, to um, take a few minutes to sort of share your background um, and how it led you to taking a leadership role in shaping the groundbreaking work of the Young Men Emerging Unit in Washington, D.C. Sure. Thanks, Ryan, for the uh, wonderful introduction. I want to also, before I begin, I want to thank everyone uh, from what I heard. was blown away by the first panel. And Primarily, I want to say to the three panelists, um, Jose and uh, I think I'm going to say it right, uh, Bill Merlin, <laughs> as well as Salim, right? You guys just, I'm standing on your shoulders. You know, you are my predecessors, and the work you're doing is so impressive to me as a current incarcerated guy, and I see the work you guys are doing and inspire me, you know, and I think that Jose said it earlier, when he, oh, a matter of fact, Mark, you may have mentioned that between the three of them, there were 80 years of incarceration experience. Eight years. So when I did the math, when I look at it, I remember Jose said he did like 30. And between his other two uh, panelists, he spent the rest of the, uh, the number to get it to 50 years, get it to 80. And I thought to myself how the 20 years, it has to be enough. It has to be a cutoff point. It has to be a point by which we can say nationally, outside of the state, the private, and the federal facilities, that we as a nation would say 20 years is enough. And we know that when we compare our nation with some of our European counterparts, they are winning. They have a more favorable rating as it relates to humanizing and treating their incarcerated people as humans. I believe we can do better. I'm an optimist. 
And I believe that we have everything that is needed to set our nation on the right page. So as I speak about my background, um, unfortunately, I have been in Costco for 26 years now. I've been in 16 different facilities. Now, that would not have been the case if I was simply in D.C. But considering that I'm a D.C. Um, incarcerated person who has a contract with the Federal Bureau of the Prison, they have a tendency to send us everywhere. <laughs> so what I like to say is that I've been in state, private, and federal facilities. And I've been awoke the entire ride. I haven't utilized some of the things that many of my uh, fellow comrades have done to survive. And I don't judge them. But only by the grace of God, I have been awoke. And I've been able to see with my eyes wide open what works and what doesn't work. So coming here in D.C., Department of Correction, and being on the leadership of the current director, Quincy Booth, is something I've never seen throughout my entire incarceration. I've never been in a place where they listen to us, where they decide to treat us fairly and equitably. So as a founding mentor with my colleague, who is no longer with me right now, but it's expedient I mentioned his name, that is Michael Wood, my friend for over 20 years. He and I have been in several institutions together. So we came here, we said, hey, when the, uh, the, the upper echelon of the administration presented us with the idea of how they can do something to work with the young adult population, we jumped in with both hands. And it has been a very rewarding experience from 2018 to the present. We've watched this um, administration treat the young men fairly. We utilized the model that I understood that was first implemented in Connecticut. And we paired with what you consider older guys, and I count like cringe a little bit and saying older. <laughs> I've been here for so long, I still think I'm a young man, but the, my gray head, uh, <laughs> it says otherwise. However, we got together with the young guys, and we decided to do this pairing. And I think that um, I'm going to echo Mike's word. Mike said we believe that the, that being the hallmark of being a mentor is leading by example. And so we decided to be the message that we bring as one of my fellow mentors like always up with here now. We wanted to be a living example of what these guys can be despite being incarcerated. However, I must admit, today, I somewhat cringe over the thought that my guys will not be under my tutorship they will be matriculating back into society and most of the guys will be going back into federal grounds. When the politics is the worst. So I have these guys who are now being treated like human beings. Inside of what I mean, we, we have made the word inmate prohibited. We only refer to as mentees or mentors or incarcerated residents. So we've been treated as human beings from day one. However, when they go back into the uh, federal institution where DC residents would be sent to, they have to navigate a lot of things that my mentors and I had to navigate from a young age. And that frightens me. So I wonder, in addition to 20 years being enough, how can we be effective in convincing those who are ministering these different facilities to do a model that works. A model that works here, we have the privilege of hosting several people from across the nation, as well as the world, to come inside of what I mean and get a peek at what we do here, with the hope to implementing the same practices in their respective facilities. Something like that is needed while we're incarcerated, and we, the work that Brother Salim and all the other pilots spoke about that can help us stop us from coming in and even dealing with us equity while we're in, as well as the safety net that can catch us when we go out. So we have those three tier works, the pre, the current, and the post. And uh, those are some of the things that run through my mind, but I will yield and, and just, want to, just, just want to say again that uh, the first panelist, man, you guys just set me on fire, and I, I, I'm very humbled 
and the film was awesome. You know, I looked at the names. I was paying attention to all the names in the credit. <laughs> and I feel honored to even know you guys, you know. So kudos to the work you guys are doing. And this, um, this is going to be a beautiful conversation. Thank you, Joel. And it's, it has been, I mean, you are, you have been a part. I mean, I, when I refer to you as a colleague, I truly mean it. We've, we've had an opportunity to work together and um, I look forward to an opportunity to work, continue to work together with you outside with the rest of us um, on these really important issues. I, I want to shift a little bit. Joel sort of laid out some of the steps that they've tried to, to, to take in building this really groundbreaking unit in, in the district. And I want to sort of go a little bit back in the system now and, and try to have a little bit of a conversation around the prevention piece. And Joel's talked about a little what happens after violence has happened, what happens after folks are incarcerated. Um, but I want to get a, an opportunity to talk a little bit about the prevention piece, which is critically important. Uh, any effort to roll back mass incarceration isn't purely about the mass incarceration work, the sentencing work, the parole work, the reentry work. It's also about trying to work to strengthen communities to prevent violence in the first place. And so, um, Fatima, I wanted to shift to you uh, to talk a little bit about some of the work that you and the Health Alliance uh, for Violence Intervention are doing. Um, to, to share a little bit of those experiences, because I feel like this public health centered approach that, that, I, that I see both you and, and Daniela Common Justice doing um, is really unique. And, and for me working in the criminal justice field for, for 20 years, I'm still getting up to speed with it and it's a really powerful model. But I think for a lot of folks out there, um, this is gonna be some of the first time. So if you could share a little bit of those experiences with, with our viewers. Of course, um, thank you, Ryan, and um, thank you all for having such a powerful conversation. Um, it is such an honor to be among you, Joelle. I just want you to know your your voice moves me deeply, um, and to hear you say uh, that you're an optimist in these times, um, it is it is um, fuel for our movement. It truly is. And it is unfortunate that we have to rely on the resilience of souls like yours and um, Jose and Rose Marilyn, Rose Marilyn, excuse me, and Tyrone, um, in order to imagine um, a, a new world. It's on your backs, it's on your efforts. And so I just wanted to say thank you. Oh. Um, as, yes. <laughs> Um, as, as Ryan said, I, I um, lead the Health Alliance for Violence Intervention. Uh, we are a national and um, an increasingly international organization um, that focuses on hospital-based violence intervention. Um, we are one of several models um, that look further upstream at addressing uh, violence. Uh, so I'll talk about that in a moment, but I first want to just stitch together um, as Ryan uh, began to lift up that piece of the, the story of structural violence um, is about police brutality and over-policing, the function of police in our society, mass incarceration, but there's also an overwhelming amount of neglect and neglect particularly for the vestiges, the intergenerational vestiges of, of slavery and harm that has happened in communities of color that per perpetuates a tremendous amount of trauma that is untreated and unaddressed in communities. And our response to that trauma as a society is to do nothing. And the cost of that for communities, what we lose in terms of the thriving, the life, the prosperity of people is, is such a, a deep part of structural violence that gets unspoken. So it is our, it is our task to speak it, to name it, um, and to talk about opportunities to um, address that trauma. It is a big issue. And I, I lead with structural violence and trauma before we get to interpersonal, um, because interpersonal is often uh, where we like to talk about the model, but it, it's important to start with that. So our particular work um, is looking at communities that again have been, have experienced tremendous trauma already and uh, there are individuals who have experienced that trauma that enter our hospitals, often who've been shot, stabbed. Um, and at that point in their experience, again, there's been a tremendous amount of personal trauma and we can go back generations, um, but we have an opportunity in hospitals. We have an opportunity while they're healing to 
to sit by them and listen to their stories and in, in, in many ways support uh, their own navigation of systems to ensure that they get the resources they need uh, for their own thriving. And to do that work, we partner communities with hospitals to hire those who are typically far, formerly incarcerated, those who have been impacted themselves by violence, um, to be the, the, what we call violence intervention specialists, right? The ones who um, are leading uh, the care, the care uh, for, for those who are um, at greatest risk. And we do this um, at hospitals because we know that, um, the, the, we know the risk trajectories. So those who um, have been violently shot, stabbed, injured, wounded, their chance of coming back into the hospital, right, for re-injury, retaliatory violence, increases by 40%. So, um, and we know that navigating those systems of being harmed and being harmed again, alongside uh, potential responses of reta retaliation uh, and incarceration and going back out, that these are all re revolving doors um, of, of violence and, res and the res our responses to violence. And that our ability to insert a, a structure of care um, is, is but one step, but an important one. And we see really remarkable results, even though uh, we're further upstream, but there, we can go even further, right? So I wanna just continue to say that we can be radical and reimagining systems, um, but this particular work is incredibly powerful. It's powerful for our violence intervention specialists who have an opportunity to contribute um, and give care and really support and talk to um, and, and heal and be a, a, an agent for healing in communities. And it's powerful for those who experience this work um, and, and are able to go on. We, the kind of wraparound services we provide, the housing, uh, the job training, employment, um, and we don't, we don't have a limit to that. So our programs, we are currently in 70 cities um, for those who've been around and those who are starting. Um, that work uh, we see happening in the long term. So we don't, we don't just say that we're done when people uh, aren't, aren't in, the, in the very short term retaliating or committing violence. It is about the lives of people and their families. It's about focusing and centering health and healing. Uh, it's about recognizing that even the systems that are set up for victims, right? And we talk a lot about um, victim services for those of you who have not, uh, don't know that there are um, services, there's resources available for those who are victims um, of violence and victims of crime um, to the tune of billions of dollars, right? That sit at the federal level and then are distributed across states. The, the likelihood that those resources actually get to these communities um, that are disproportionately impacted by violence are thin um, and are, are certainly um, uh, not used. They're mitigated by things like cooperation with the police, right? So, so there are incredible challenges there. So even, even those systems, even when there is opportunities for victims to receive some support, they're not going to communities that need them most. So uh, it's a huge concern. But again, I want us to, I want to continue to push us and want to, to talk about ways that we can reimagine systems of care that, that center health and healing, uh, ones that invest at, at, at the scale and the level of the problem that has been um, ongoing for generations, because that, that's, a, that's a big conversation. Um, and, I, and again, I'm gonna stop here and just say, it's such an honor to be a part of this conversation to think with all of you about ways we can reimagine and go further upstream and, and, and address those root causes because it, it makes then the tool of mass incarceration obsolete. Thank you so much for, for, for making that connection. And I think um, one of the things that, um, that we've noticed a lot, certainly during COVID, has been the importance role of, of healthcare providers and physicians, importantly, in sort of calling for reform. Some of the local place-based work that we do at Justice Policy Institute in DC and Maryland early on in March was actually helping pull together sign-on letters to, from physicians calling for 
um, getting people out of these facilities, identifying how these uh, carceral settings are are some of the worst. Um, and so I'm I, I've, I've been really encouraged by that and hearing your work, and I'm hopeful that that will continue. But that's a community of people that need to be front and center as we talk through what a new model looks like. Um, so let me shift over to you, Danielle, to talk a little bit about the work of common justice. And I think in particular, because you all certainly do put sort of survivors of trauma at the very center of your work. Um, and it is a really unique groundbreaking program. It has been for a very long time. And it's the one I know that anytime anybody sort of talks to me about, if not prison, what? The first thing I said is you need to go check out common justice website. So please share some of your thoughts with our viewers. Let me echo the thanks and honor to all the other panelists. Um, it's, it's really profound to be here with you today. And so I appreciate it really deeply. And I wanna say that like, Joelle, of course, 20 should be enough. And I also wanna just say like over and over again, and like down to the marrow of all of our bones that 20 is too much. And it's actually my belief that 10 is too much. And it is my belief that five is too much. And it's even, and I may be an outlier in this group, but my belief that one is too much. And part of why I believe that is because the thing we are doing in response to violence generates further harm. So I understand in our policy debate why we have to fight to get from 30 or to 20 or from 20 to 10 or 10 to five or five to three. And I know every minute of freedom we secure through those efforts is valuable because that is a human being's freedom and the people who love them get to love them up close and differently than for every one of those minutes that we win. And at the same time, when we are envisioning with each other, I think it's so important that we shake off the habits we have in like the, that we have to put on when we walk the halls of the legislatures and not pretend we think prison is useful. Um, like we talk often as though there is a debate about whether prison reduces future violence or is ineffective at reducing future violence. And what we know to be true is that prison generates violence. So echoing Fatima, the core drivers of violence are structural, right? The best place to target your efforts if you want to end violence is ending white supremacy. Like the best intervention you could make to end violence would be reparations, right? Like far better than anything you're ever going to do with policing, undoubtedly. And some of that would look like investments in institutions like hospitals, like schools, like mental health supports, like all of the things that we provide to the people whose humanity we structurally value as a country, not just intellectually, but that we value in our expenditure, right? But on the individual level, even within those structures, when we think about why does one person commit violence when another might not, even when they're similarly situated, we know the core drivers of violence at that level are shame, isolation, exposure to violence, and an inability to meet one's economic needs. And the core features of prison are shame, isolation, exposure to violence, and an inability to meet one's economic needs. So it means we are trying to put out a house fire with a tank of gasoline, which is why when you say how much gasoline is enough to put out a fire, it's a ridiculous question, right? Like you are not coming with a tool. You are coming with something that escalates exactly the harm you claim to be undoing. And so for me, I think about, um, I think about this in terms of our visioning, in terms of our ability to really center our values and wisdom and knowledge about what prison is and isn't. But I also think about it in how we animate really strong movements to demand profound change. And I think about a mentor of mine growing up in Chicago who used to say, it's hard to get people excited to fight for a shit sandwich easy on the shit. Um, and of course, like, and in many ways, I think when we're like, we want, a 15 year max instead of a 20 year max, right? And of course, if I'm eating a shit sandwich, I would like as thin a spread as possible, like no doubt. And at the same time, I'm like, can we start to say like, what do we want instead? And so at Common Justice, we do restorative justice for serious and violent crimes up to and including attempted murder. People with the consent of those they've harmed enter into a process where they reach agreements about how to make things as right as possible. And if they go through our violence intervention program and fulfill those commitments to the person who was harmed by their actions, 
they don't go to prison and the felony charges against them are dismissed. So they're left only with a misdemeanor on their record. And the last thing I'll say before I close is that not only does this have a profound effect on our responsible parties, which is what we call what others call by other names, um, but that we, I said, we only take these cases of survivors of violence consent. And in our experience and all of our more than decade doing this, when people who have been hurt are asked, and these are people who called the police, fewer than half of victims even do that. So to pretend our criminal justice system is victim centered is nonsense because 50% is still an F in any classroom I've been in. And that's where we're starting. And then of those half who call the police, another half drop out before grand jury. So shame on us if we ever step back and let the criminal justice system talk to us like they're the ones who claim to, who care about victims. But in that 25% who are still in the system, of the subset of those who experience serious violence, we go to them and we say, do you want the person who hurt you incarcerated or do you want them in common justice? And 90% choose common justice, 90%. And it's a wild number because of the stories we've been told, but they choose it because as survivors, we are pragmatic. And at the end of the day, the two things survivors cannot stand are one, the thought of someone else going through what we went through, and two, the thought of ourselves going through it, right? We can't stand it happening to us again. We can't stand it happening to somebody else. And so when we are faced with options, we choose the thing that we think make it least likely that someone else will hurt somebody again. And anybody who lives in a neighborhood where incarceration is common knows that prison is not that thing because they have paid the price of prison's failure with their enduring pain. And so I would push us when we think about our fight to vastly expand the range of people who we believe can be brought with us. I think we should understand when we are fighting to end long prison terms that we are fighting for crime victims. We are fighting for survivors. And I would push us at least in the way we imagine with each other However often we have to go fight for a shit sandwich easy on the shit to actually have the conversations along the ones that Fatima is inviting us into, along the kinds of relational things, Joel, that you're describing, like what all of the first panel lays out, that we actually start to imagine not just the like slimmest spread of shit we can get, but what it would be to demand food that really nourishes us. Thank you, Thank you Danielle. Um, that's, uh, there are my, there's nobody I like hearing more and you have some, some of the metaphors are, they, they stick with you. So I, I, I appreciate that and sharing that. Um, so I have to do the unfair moderators, uh, role of asking each of you a sort of closing question and asking you to answer a complex social issue with centuries worth of history behind it in 60 seconds or so. Um, so Joelle, I'm gonna put you on the spot first and, and just ask you a little bit now, we, we both in the last two panels been talking about the role of violence prevention in the community. And I know that we've discussed this in the past and you have some thoughts, particularly about roles for formerly incarcerated individuals as violence interrupters and roles they play in the community. And if you could in 60 to 90 seconds or so sort of share your um, your thoughts uh, about sort of a role for for people who have been formerly incarcerated as as real agents of, of public safety and and of sort of strengthening communities. Absolutely, one of the things I noticed that during our incarceration, particularly as older guys in the federal institution, we function as mentors and violent interventions and all of those wonderful sounding sounding terms without being officially recognized by the administration. So uh, we were the guys that were called in and say, hey, we have a problem going on. And can you fix this is going on? Or it may be something we know that's happening behind the scenes, which allows us to be able to broker a deal of peace. I believe that if we can have those same individuals who are currently like right here in the posture of DC, we have a, we're, we're anticipating the, the uh, law to be passed. And this will allow individuals who have been incarcerated age of 25 to come back and have a meaningful opportunity to regain their freedom. Um, these same individuals have been functioning, most of them, I would say, men and women have been functioning as the so-called big homies where they were at. And, at. and under that role, you had to intermediate a lot of different type of things that's happening in the facility. I thought that what if these guys and girls were actually trained to be mentors? So like the work that's going on with Credible Messenger and a lot of the other reputable organizations happen here in DC. We can use these pool of individuals who can go back to the community they once were agents of destruction 
to be agents of peace, agents of construction, building, hope, and harmony. And this is a pool that we can use, that we can maximize this opportunity to give them the skills, the training they already have on a more official uh, uh, capacity, if you will, because they already have skin in the game. We can use these individuals. And the other thing I want to say real fast, um, wow, <laughs> the two panels, they, just, they dropped like balls. <laughs> I mean, a lot of stuff, right? And I thought that what you were saying, Fatima, uh, was that if we can be able from the, in the prevention phase, if you will, to stop us from coming in and, and record numbers. I was having a conversation with some of my mentees, and we immediately realized that in our communities, particularly in the, uh, the low-class communities, there are so many um, alcoholic um, uh, uh, units where they sell like, like, like alcohol and, and drug paraphernalia, and it's like our communities are being flooded with this stuff. What if we could dismantle that and put us in trauma centers? begin to allow the people who are experiencing these traumas to get some sort of help that can stop the revolving door that she spoke about. And as Ms. Uh, uh, Danielle has spoke about, the re-justice toward the re peace also. I'll yield with that right there. Yeah. Thank you, Joel. Um... Fatima, I just want to jump to you to get, you know, again, in 60 to 90 seconds, sort of, um, what can we in this community do to connect with the healthcare community. I think COVID-19 has started those relationships and awakened a lot of folks in the healthcare community, but what else can we do from our side to sort of build those bridges? Well, I mean, first, we, how, how can I um, follow Joel and all those brilliant ideas? We got to get Joel out, right? Like that's, <laughs> um, I I've personally um, think that it's important, and Danielle spoke to this, um, that we've got to, it's important to address white supremacy, ensure that we're talking about racism in all these institutions, right? So um, my um, health and public health counterparts are um, incredible, strategic. Uh, these are institutions we want to invest in, but we want to make sure that we're building them still to center the needs of those who are most marginalized and actually build that infrastructure with our needs in mind. I think that's incredibly important. Um, you know, thinking about infrastructure work, uh, we've, we've got to align um, our resources um, based on the things that we value. So we're working um, right now to think about things like Medicaid, so insurance, right? We were instrumental at the Javi in a securing, so these violence prevention professionals, right? These folks who are doing this work on the front lines, giving care and helping stop violence and mitigating re-injury, re-victimization, re-traumatization, re um, they're in the taxonomy, the health taxonomy, where nurses are and doctors are, right? Saying that they, they're valued for the care they give. And now we're trying to get insurance companies to pay, right? To pay for their work and their labor and their service. Um, because th that, that's what building infrastructure looks like. So there's, there, there are fights to be fought, um, but we need deep investment um, in these in these programs, they need to be brought to scale. We need trauma centers, right? We need that level of care, um, and we need opportunities um, for economic prosperity. Those have their part and parcel. Housing, right? Th these are not rocket science, actually, right? But it's about aligning those resources with those who are um, at greatest risk and ensuring that we are addressing white supremacy at every turn, right? Because it, in the building of those systems, if we're not paying attention, right, those who are most impacted get weeded out either through whatever criteria is met for a particular program. Um, and, and we don't want that. We wanna make sure they're squarely aligned with those. Um, we need to be thinking about reentry. We need to be thinking about those who are coming home to us um, as, as we build out these systems, right? So it, it, it's incredibly important. And that means those who are impacted being um, at these tables to, in the decision-making, ensuring that we're talking squarely with those who've been impacted as we build, as we build this infrastructure. Thank you so much. And then Danielle, if you could just take us home with, in, with sort of your kind of observation of, you've sort of said what our system looks like now, what would a really sort of victim-centered system look like in your vision? I mean, a victim-centered system, I believe, would look a lot like the system Joelle described. And I think one of the things that's important to remember is it's not like incarcerated people and survivors are different groups of people. Like I have yet to meet anyone who learned violence by committing it first. I have not met a single person 
who's incarcerated for causing harm, who's not a survivor of harm, not one. And so when we think about like who is at the table, like at a survivor centered table, a young man of color is 10 times more likely than me to be robbed or assaulted. So for starters, that table has 10 more young black men than it has white ladies like me. That is not the table we have been used to sitting at when we've answered the question about who victims are and what they need. There would be more women of color at that table than white women every time. So that vision and who holds it would be shaped by the people who have been harmed. And I think fundamentally, like in thinking about what survivors want from the criminal justice system, our system now is one where if someone burns down your house, all it can do for you is go burn down their house. What survivors want is someone to rebuild somewhere where they can live. And so when we envision something, we envision a, a work that is not as much about tearing people down, that is not even just about tearing institutions down, but that is about building people up and building the institutions that will secure their well-being and survival. Thank you very much. And thank thank all three of you. That was a really great conversation under very tight timing. And so I, I uh, appreciate your, your willingness to dive in and have to answer really deep questions under a tight, tight timeline. Um, so thank you all very much. And, and I'm gonna pass over now to my colleague and friend, Keith Wallington. Thank you, Ryan, and um, thank you also to all the panelists, uh, Brave New Films, and thank you, Open Society Foundation, for uh, enabling this event today. Um, this was a great event, and um, you know, I, I listened from both a crime as a crime survivor and also as someone who's been working in this field, uh, particularly here in Maryland, um, with a lot of partners that are on the call now and also listening in on. Uh, some of the long sentencing um, issues and parole issues we have in Maryland. Um, as Leonard opened up, um, um, you know, with, and we've heard repeatedly throughout the conversation today, um, long sentences and over-incarceration don't keep us safe, um, doesn't really address harms caused in or steeped in racism. Um, and although today's conversation um, is a national conversation, you know, it really, you know, I heard it from my ears here in Maryland. So today's conversation spoke to Maryland from start to finish. The film could have been called, you know, um, the problems with Maryland's justice system. Like it really spoke to what's going on here in Maryland. Uh, Maryland not only leads the country um, in racial disparities in our justice system, but also has a horrible track record of releasing folks uh, serving long sentences. Um, and, but what Maryland also has is a natural case study um, that speaks to the conversation that we've had today. Some of you are familiar with the Ungers. Um, the Ungers in Maryland are a, um, you know, they're a cohort of almost 235 individuals, all who served at least uh, an average of 40 years in prison for violent offenses um, and uh, began coming home about eight years ago. The Ungers, when they, um, when they began coming home, were, um, I think, an average age of about 64 years old. Um, and as Jose mentioned earlier, you know, at, um, as Jose said about long sentence services, servers, uh, and is the case with the Ungers, not only you know, have they not been a public safety threat since they became coming home eight years ago, but they've been invaluable to the homes and communities that they've uh, returned back to. Um, and also, you know, we talked about public safety. The, the, the recidivism rate among the Ungers uh, is about 6% here in Maryland, which is a fraction of the total overall recidivism rate in Maryland. And it clearly dispels the public safety argument. So again, the Ungers are a natural case study of what can be done if sensible policies are put in place um, of the many of the kind, current kind of draconian policies that are keeping people incarcerated for too long and having a gross disproportionate impact on people of color. Um, and I know we, we're past time, as folks know, we know I can go on for, for a while here, but I'll stop here. Again, you know, just wanna reiterate the paper, uh, Long Prison Terms Eliminating Excessive Prison Sentences and developing a public health informed and community driven violence prevention strategy is necessary to reduce mass incarceration. And the film also, um, The Troubled Long Prison Terms, are available on JPI's website and also uh, Brave New Film. With that, again, I want to say thank you all for a great and valuable conversation. Again, it, it, it's, it's although, although it's a national conversation, it just spoke to um, you know, what's going on here in Maryland with our, our parole, broken parole system and long sentence service. And I'd like to particularly say thank you um, to Jose, uh, Salim, 
uh, Romero and uh, Tyrone and uh, Joel um, before we close out. And with that, um, thank you all so much for joining us. And um, Ryan, I don't know if uh, I should send it over to you or William for a closing words, or if we all just go from here. So with that, I, 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 oh, I'm sorry, Ryan, I see you jump back. I think, I, think, I think we just go. All right, with that, thank you all. And we look forward to uh, any follow-up and uh, further discussions. Thank you.